right, welcome to Your Wealth Engine, the show that helps you create, grow, and protect your wealth through the power of free market capitalism. Oh, I've got quite a show today. I've been working on some data related to U.S. and Chinese banks. It's a question that I've recently been thinking about. What's happening with the bank sector? Personally, I don't really like investing in banks because why? They're controlled by government. They are not a, I would say, first, they're controlled by government. Second, they're a commodity. Banks are a commodity. If one bank was to issue a certain type of credit card that was new and unique, all the other banks would quickly copy it. And so it's hard to see that one bank will rise above the other over a long period of time. Whereas you can see some industries where they're creating a new product or service that is, in fact, a smash hit, and that company could rise massively relative to other companies. So this is one of the reasons. So first, I don't really like banks too much because they're government controlled. Second of all, it's a commodity business. And um, also, you know, with banks, because of that, Basically, banks just give you can give you exposure to a market, and you can get exposure to a market through, let's say, an ETF, as an example. Well, I just want to welcome everybody here to the show. I see Jing Jing says good morning and good morning to you. And also, I see Asa W says good morning, Mr. Andrew. And Ja Rubut says good morning, Andrew. Yes, it's a beautiful morning. It's 7 a.m. here in beautiful Bangkok, Thailand, and I just had my morning espresso, and I've been up early this morning working on this bank data because I want to answer the question about banks. You know, should should I look at it? Are, are U.S. banks going to collapse? Like I've heard some people say that the banking sector is going to collapse with the interest rates rising. And another question is, are Chinese banks going to to collapse. So today we're going to look at that in more detail. But I thought before we do, we're going to look into the market. So let me share my screen with you and show you the topics for today. Now, the title is U.S. banks over Chinese banks. That's right now, as I see it, it may switch later. But the first thing we're going to talk about is a decline in U.S. profitability and earnings momentum could lead to opportunities in emerging markets and ASEAN. The second thing we're going to look at is U.S. banks. So we're just going to focus on U.S. banks first and see that they've been cranking up lending and expanding margins. But real estate could be a significant risk. And next, the third topic and the final topic, U.S. banks. Now we're going to compare U.S. versus Chinese banks. U.S. banks are strong. The main risk is the real estate loans, as I've said. And then long-term fall from high profits at Chinese banks, partially driven by recapitalization. So banks have been recapitalizing in China, but they've also seen their profitability fall. And that hasn't been really good for investing in banks in China. So let's look at the markets overall first. We'll start at that point. So here we have a, a picture of the markets. I like to use this summary. And the first thing that we can see, this is updated as of the 3rd of November. Uh, recently, the New York Stock Exchange rebounded, but the tech-heavy NASDAQ didn't. It's going in opposite directions where the world is switching away from tech and more towards traditional business. Also, we can see that China has continued to fall and down about 6%, and Hong Kong down about 10% in the past week, and basically it's down 34% year-to-date. Now, also, remember, the Nasdaq's down about 34% year to date. So Hong Kong is taking a bit of a beating. And what you can say is that, uh, first of all, you know, there's issues related to the Chinese running of Hong Kong. And maybe many people may feel like it's not as free as it was or not as much of a capitalist place as it was in the past. And then you also have the risk, you know, that the, the Hong Kong dollar has been pegged to the U.S. dollar for a long time. And there's some people that may be questioning that. I don't think that's going to be a big uh, issue right now. Uh, and markets in Europe have been rebounding a bit. We can see Europe uh, is up, the European exchange is up about 
5.5%. So we have seen some recovery, but most of these countries are down pretty substantially. You can see Germany's down about 26% year to date. But I would say that Europe actually hasn't been hammered too hard relative to the rest of the world. Now, Europe was already pretty cheap, but given what's going on there. And last, I just want to highlight India has been so strong. I mean, Indian market and this one, I'm looking at the National Stock Exchange. But basically, year to date, this is this is markets up 3.3 percent, which is the highest of any market. The only one competing with that would be Brazil. And if we look at India over the past five years, it's up 84 percent. What you can say from that is that India is a very uh, domestically led uh, economy and a domestically led market. And the result of that is that they haven't been crushed by the turmoil that's going on across the world. Now, let's talk for a moment about an investment framework. How do you invest? What framework do you use? This is a question I've had for many years uh, for myself, but it's easy to be emotionally affected by market events, which can cause you to make rash and costly decisions. To avoid this, I stick to our framework that we've created, and the strategies rely on data and structure rather than on feelings. So I try to rely on a framework. So I just thought I'd go through the framework for a moment, and then we'll go through the global markets using this framework. I call my framework FVMR. And the first part is to understand at the top of this diagram, I show that management is responsible for earnings and investors ultimately set price. So if we look at the first F, the first letter F, fundamentals, this is related to earnings. And we, of course, prefer management delivering strong and rising profitability. The V stands for valuation, and this is related to the price and prefer companies that are valued at fair prices. And then we have momentum, both in earnings and price. I look for positive earnings momentum and positive price momentum. And then finally, the R stands for risk. Prefer low financial and earnings risk and like prices that deliver stable returns. So again, that FVMR framework forces me into a disciplined way of looking at the market, a structured way, a framework way. So let's look at the first letter, fundamentals. What can we see? What we can see here is that profitability remains at very high levels across the world. World ROE is expected to actually rise from 15% to 16% in 2022. Now, I use consensus numbers for 2022, and we know we've almost seen the year uh, almost done, basically. So these are uh, current estimates. Margin across the world right now is at 11%. That's extremely high. And most of that's being driven by North America, which is mainly the US. So developed markets have the highest profitability, 16% ROE and up to 17% is what's expected by analysts for 2022. And the long-term average for net margin is about 6%. So you can say that we're almost double the long-term average of profitability. Now, ASEAN has been seeing some rising profitability. We can see ROE going from 8 to 10% and uh, the net margin going from 11 to 12%. So pretty good in the ASEAN markets. So now let's dig down a little bit and look at fundamentals in Asia. And what we can see is Japan is stable. Singapore and Indonesia show improving fundamentals. So in fact, that's kind of a, an interesting one that Indonesia already has a pretty high ROE and people are expecting that it's going to rise from 14% up to 17%, making it one of the more profitable markets around Asia. Also, Taiwan is very, very high profitability ROE of about 19%, so pretty strong. But what's interesting you can see in this table is that Singapore profitability is starting to turn around. And we're seeing that the net margin is going from 10 to 15%. 15 is a very high net margin. So those are some of the companies, uh, countries that I'm looking at across Asia and ASEAN. But generally, I would say ASEAN looks pretty good, the, the Southeast Asian countries. Now let's look at valuation across the world. Stop, stocks worldwide are not yet cheap. 
PE globally is about 16, 15 to 16 times. Price to book is between two and three times. That's not that cheap. And EV to EBITDA, let's say, is about nine to 13 times. Dividend yield, about 2%. I got rid of a lot of decimals in this table just to keep it as simple as possible. Well, where is it expensive? Things are expensive in developed markets, but emerging markets are relatively cheap. Right now, emerging markets are trading on a PE of 11 times and a price to book of close to one times. Think about the price to book of developed markets. They're trading on three times. Now, of course, Emerging markets have a lot of more hard assets on their balance sheet. And the result is it's hard to see the price to book be really high, like three, four, five times, as we do see sometimes in the US. So what we can say is that, yeah, emerging markets are looking relatively cheap and you're going to get a three to 4% dividend yield. Now, emerging Europe is where some of this cheapness is coming from. It's Asia and emerging Europe. And we can see that actually the PE in emerging Europe has gone from seven times down to five. So the countries in emerging Europe are being brutalized by what's happening, uh, number one, with the strength of the dollar, and number two, with the issues about rising energy prices. So if we look deeper into Asia, we can see that China A shares appear cheap. Uh, so here we can see that China A shares are trading at about 16, 15, 14 to 16 times, about two times price to book. So they look cheap, but we have to remember that China A shares includes 30% of that market is banks. And so you have to be careful. Banks never trade at high PEs and they never trade at high price to book. Why is it that banks never trade at high PEs and high price to book? This is an important lesson to learn. If you ever see a bank trading at, let's say, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times PE, or a price to book of, let's say, one time, sometimes even like 0.9. You have to be careful in that case because banks tend to never trade at high multiples. Why is that? Well, because if we look at the typical company, its funding comes 40% from equity. That means that if 40% of the assets of a company went bad, it would wipe out the equity. Well, 40% of the assets of any traditional company is never going to go bad. Maybe 1%, right? But now let's talk about banks. If you look at the typical bank, the assets are funded only 10% by equity. What that means is that if the bank had non-performing assets, of 10% that they had to write off, they would wipe out the equity of the bank. So this is the reason why banks never trade at high profit margins relative um, to other companies. Now, also what we can see in this diagram here is that Japanese banks are trading at book value and I think are starting to look interesting to me. And Malaysia, is uh, sorry, Japanese companies. I didn't mean to say Japanese banks. Japanese companies are trading at book value. That's pretty darn cheap from my perspective. What's also interesting about Japan and Japanese companies is that Japanese government is massive, borrowing massive amounts of money, but Japanese companies are not. In fact, they're very conservative. And so when you worry about the debt in Japan, you worry about the debt relative to the government, not relative to the companies. What does this mean? Well, if the currency of the, Jap the Japanese yen continues to fall, what we will see is that more and more money will go into Japan because the companies are not expensive and they're not levered up. Now, also, I would just point out that within ASEAN, Malaysia is pretty darn cheap, 13 to 14 times price to book, one time, or sorry, PE, one times price to book, and a strong dividend yield of about 4%. So Malaysia looks interesting. Now, Malaysia never gets super expensive. I would call it more of a defensive market, but at least you can see that there is some opportunity there. Let's look at earnings and price momentum to understand what's going on around the world. And here's what we can see. The emerging markets revenue growth is not feeding through to profits. 
what is happening here? Analysts are expecting revenues to increase by 13% in 2022, but EPS to increase by only 9%. In other words, a portion of that increase in revenue is being consumed by higher costs. And so that is a bit of a challenge for emerging markets. Now, in ASEAN, it's different. It's just the opposite. Analysts are expecting 18% sales growth in 2022 and EPS growth of 31%. In other words, rising profit margin. And so from that perspective, I would say that uh, ASEAN does look pretty interesting relative to uh, other regions right now. Now, also, earnings recovery is, I, is expected by analysts in China, Asia, Indonesia, and Thailand. Let's look at that for a moment. Again, we can see the revenue growth forecast for 2022 by analysts is 8%. And the profit growth, this is for China A shares, is 25%. So they're expecting some margin expansion in China. And if we look at Indonesia, it's pretty remarkable. 16% revenue growth in 2021. That was a fantastic result. And in 2022, analysts are expecting now 19%. And that is leading into a growth in EPS of 32% and 36%, meaning the margins in Indonesia are rising. Fundamentals are getting better. And as a result, we can see that the price performance in Indonesia has been very strong year to date. Indonesia is actually up 13% relative to other countries. And then we can see Thailand actually also looks interesting. Now it's less of a uh, improvement. We're seeing that revenue, or revenue growth is forecast by analysts to rise by 25% and EPS about 23. So basically the expectation is that most of the revenue growth will feed through to profits. We can also see that the Thai market, having been beaten for a long time, now is showing pretty strong um, relative performance, and I would say is somewhat of a safe bet in Asia. So now let's look at risk. The develop, developed Europe and Latin America are saddled with huge amounts of debt, which we can see in, uh, in developed Europe, about 81% debt to equity, and in Latin America, about 96% debt to equity. Also, the ASEAN has been the least volatile uh, region out of all of them. And I think this is an important point about the ASEAN region is that there is less volatility in, um, in, in the market. Also, the correlation with the US market is a little bit less than other regions. And the result of that is that sometimes ASEAN can perform uh, relatively well when global markets are getting hit. And emerging Europe and US are the most volatile. And we can see that the volatility over the last year for emerging Europe has been 50%. That's massive compared to 23% in North America. So what are the key points in the bottom line? In this section, I want you to understand a few things. The first, in relation to fundamentals, Developed markets have high profitability led by the U.S. Japan and ASEAN show improving fundamentals. So margins are rising. What about valuation? Stocks are not yet cheap. Emerging Europe has been devastated and valuations are cheap there. Bank heavy, China A shares, not cheap yet. And Japan and Malaysia cheap. And we've seen a very defensive India. And it's defensive and expensive. So you have to pay for that defensive nature and strong growth that's happening in India. What about momentum? Emerging markets revenue growth is not feeding through to profits, except in China, Indonesia, and Thailand. What's the risk? ASEAN is the least volatile and emerging markets, in particularly emerging Europe, is the most. So what is the bottom line? What are you trying to say, Andrew? Well, here it is. The decline in U.S. profitability and earnings momentum could lead to opportunities in emerging markets and ASEAN. So many people are overweight the U.S. The market has fallen a lot in the U.S., but the U.S. dollar has been very strong. At some point, the dollar will start to show some weakness, 
And when it does, then you could say emerging markets and ASEAN could look interesting. So that's my wrap on my summary of kind of what's going on in global markets and how to think about positioning. Now, my positioning is still pretty neutral, 25% stocks, 25% bonds, 25% commodities, and 25% gold. I just feel like now's not a time to be a hero, right? Now is a time where we have to be thoughtful uh, about how we're investing. All right. So the next thing I want to do is time to dig into banks. And I want to just briefly talk about this because uh, banks are a fascinating uh, topic. When I started my career in 1993, my first roughly 10 years was as a bank analyst. So all I looked at was banks. So it, it helped me understand a lot more about the economy. And for the young people out there who are starting to become analysts, I always recommend try to become a bank analyst because that is something that will keep you in touch with the global economy, with the economy of the country, of the banks that you're analyzing. And you will become, I think, a better, more rounded analyst. Also, banks are a major part of markets, particularly in the developing or emerging markets where banks tend to be 20, 30% of the overall market. The bigger and more sophisticated a stock market gets, the lower the banks go as far as their weight in the market capitalization. So a more developed market may have banks at only 10% or 15% of the total value of the market. So let's go back to the presentation and look at the topic, which is U.S. banks have been cranking up lending and expanding margins, but real estate could be a significant risk. So let's go into this in a little bit more detail. And what I'm going to do here is first, keep it really simple. I'm just going to break the balance sheet of U.S. banks down into three items. This is the asset side of the balance sheet. Banks either have cash, loans and securities or other items. So the U.S. banks now have $3 trillion in cash, which is a high level at about 13.6% of their total assets. That means for every deposit that the bank is receiving, 136 of it goes into cash, and the bank sits on that cash. This is what banks do when they're scared about the current situation. Now, 76% of the bank's balance sheet is either loans or securities. And when you think about it, a bank either lends money or it, it lends money uh, through buying securities of the government or of private sector companies. So also what we can see is that the cash is down $1 trillion over the past 12 months. That's a 24% decline in cash. That's massive for U.S. banks. Basically, they were in a very precarious situation after the crisis, during the crisis. And the result of that is that they just held a lot of cash to be careful. And now they seem to be willing to start to lend again. So let's look at this for a moment. I've made this chart of GDP growth and loan growth in the U.S. And what we can see is that uh, the loan growth, the blue line, has really accelerated in 2022. In fact, this is one of the biggest loan growths we've had since about 2005, 2006. We're almost back that, to peak levels of loan growth that we saw just before the 2008 crisis. Where is, who's borrowing all this money? Well, the first thing we have to consider is that loan growth actually was very low if I, if I look at this, I can look at the period over the last few years and loan growth has been about 5% and now it's about 12%. So it's been down for a while and now we see it coming into the economy. All right, so now let's get a little bit more granular on the balance sheet of the banks. What we can see is that I've now broken out the banks into securities and loans. So what we can see from this is that securities account for about 24% of the balance sheets of banks and loans about 50, let's just say 25 for securities and 50% for loans. And that combined gives us about 
of the balance sheet of banks in these two items. Why is it important to hold these two items? Because they earn money. And if we look at it, what we can see is that the banks, basically about 20% of securities are government securities, particularly in America, the banks are kind of forced to buy bonds from the government. And for different reasons, there's collateral reasons and many different things that are going on. There's not other buyers for government securities in the past when interest rates were really low. So we can see that government securities account for about 20% of the total assets of the US banks. I would say that's a very high number. Now, the other thing we can see is that real estate accounts for 23% of total loans and uh, sorry, of total assets. So real estate loans as a percent of total assets are 23%. Now, here's where it gets interesting. What we can see is cash has fallen pretty substantially and overall assets grew by about 2.7 year on year as of October. But most of that growth is happening in the lending area, and particularly commercial loans is the big area and then consumer loans. So that is where things are at as of right now. And that gives us a picture of the bank's balance sheet. Now, uh, Nan asked the question, good morning, Andrew, any hope in the U.S.? Uh, market better after midterms. I think the U.S. Uh, market, my forecast for the U.S. midterms is that the Republicans will get a majority in the House and in the Senate, and that will switch things pretty substantially more towards the fixing the economy, more towards the market, more towards more energy production. And the result of that is that we should see that things start to get a bit better in the markets and in the economy, but it may not be easy to do with such dramatic rises in interest rates that we're seeing done by the Fed. When you increase interest rates so fast, you are really putting a shockwave through the whole economy. So I would say that it's going to be hard for the Republicans to, to, to change the pace of that. Now, part of it is that for Republicans to be successful, they need to put a lot of laws and bills into Congress and get them passed. The House and the Senate may pass what Republicans want, but Biden still can veto what they put to him. And as a result, he could block all the actions that the uh, House and Senate, if it's controlled by the Republicans, are pushing. And if that happens, what's going to be is we have two years of almost no activity. Now, some one of the theories about the stock market is when there's no activity in government, the stock market does well because government's not messing around with it. But I, I would say one thing that's interesting to me is that oil price is down a lot over the last six months. And I would say some of that is that I believe the market is anticipating that, um, that the, uh, the Republicans will get control and they'll try to ease up on restrictions related to drilling of oil. Ong, great to see you. And what's your view on China markets uh, is what Ong's asking. And I would say I'm not yet a buyer of Chinese markets. I think that there's more to go. I think that we could be close to the bottom. It's really a matter of what the government's doing about letting the economy open up. If the government was to say that they're opening up and getting rid of zero COVID, well, yeah, I think the market could do really well. Also, uh, the banking sector is a bit of a drag on the market right now, but let's go into that in a little bit more detail. So we're going to, we're going to look at uh, China after this, but I just want to go into the U S and the key thing that I've done in this chart is I've broken down the loan book of the U.S. banks into commercial loans, meaning loans they're giving to businesses, consumer loans, meaning loans they're giving to individuals through um, credit cards and other types of things, and then real estate loans, which could be loans that are mortgage loans, or it could be loans to real estate development. And I just want to highlight the green line on this chart. If we look at this green line, I'm going to just draw a line right here. We can see there was about $3 trillion worth of loans in the 
uh, worth of real estate loans in the U.S. market back in 2005. By the time we got to 2008, we had peaked out. This is where the crisis was in 2008, a property crisis. And then we saw that start to deleverage in that sector. But since that deleveraging happened, what we're now seeing is we've seen a re-leveraging of loans to the real estate sector. And recently, this is what's fascinating, recently, because of very low interest rates set by the Fed, they have set the real estate loans on fire. And basically, a huge amount of lending has happened in the U.S. for real estate projects and real estate uh, mortgage loans and the like. And this is where I think there's a huge risk because this is data as of October. The chart says August 22, but actually it's the latest as of October. And the result of that is that uh, we haven't really even seen a huge impact by rate rising interest rates. But keep in mind that mortgage rates have gone from 3% to 7% or so. So we've seen a doubling in mortgage rates, which is going to slow down borrowing uh, in the U.S., but it's also going to basically slow down buying and expanding because nobody wants to do it if they see a situation where interest rates are just so high. So I think that we, just like we had a fall in the loans to the real estate sector, I think not only are we seeing a fall in real estate prices, but I think that we're going to see a fall in the loans from the banks to the real estate industry. And between the fall in loans to the real estate industry combined with the fall in prices of real estate, I think that we're going to see a pretty strong slowdown in that industry. Now, the second thing that I would highlight here is that commercial loans are pretty significant. We have seen a big increase in commercial loans. Basically, when the 2020 uh, COVID madness happened, what, what happened was that the government filled up the, ca the banks with cash and then had the banks push that cash out into the economy. And when they did that, basically, they bought uh, bonds of companies and they lent money to projects. And then what happened is that they then got rid of that. Men in many cases, they were able to pass the, if it was a mortgage backed securities, they could pass that on to the Fed. So the Fed would buy that. And that's the reason why we see that the commercial loans have fallen in the US uh, since their peak. But what is interesting is that we have seen an acceleration in the willingness of banks to start to lend to companies. And so you could say that lending is doing pretty well. And the last one I would highlight is consumer loans. I know uh, that a lot of people have looked at consumer loans from a perspective of the banks. I'm not too worried about consumer loans, uh, but from a perspective of just the U.S. being highly leveraged, yes, you could have some worry there. Um, now, uh, Jaru Boat, Boot says, in the U.S., are mortgage loans fixed rate or flexible? The U.S. is, is a unique market. And the result in the U.S. is that almost all of the mortgage loans in the U.S. are fixed rate. Everywhere else around the world, they're not. It's not a natural situation. That, the U, that loans would be fixed rate. Why is that? Because uh, the banking sector in the U.S. is financed by deposits. And in fact, I think it's a good time to look at that structure. So I'm going to go back to my presentation to start to answer this question. And here we can see the liabilities of the U.S. banks. 78% of U.S. bank funding comes from low cost deposits. Now, when you deposit money at a bank, how long do you want to leave that money there? Well, a portion of the deposits at a bank, a portion of them are salary deposits. And when your salary is deposited at the bank, you're going to spend most of that. So that's short term in nature. And then you may set up a, in America, we call it a certificate of deposit in Thailand and around the world, we call it a time deposit. You may give the bank money for a year or something, but if you were to calculate the average maturity of banks' deposits, 
you're talking about somewhere between three and nine months. And that means that all of the loan, all of the deposits will be repriced within, let's say, nine months. The result of that is that the banks have deposits which are short-term funding. If interest rates start to rise, the banks have to start to raise deposit rates, and that cost of funds will rise. And that's the reason why a bank wants to have a floating rate loan, because then when the cost of deposits rise, the earnings that they get on their loans are going to rise. But if you are in a situation where you have a fixed rate loan and you were a bank and you lent out money at, let's say, 3% and you were getting deposits at 2% and all of a sudden deposits go up to 4 or 5%, what happens then is that in theory, that loan would be underwater it would be earning a tiny return, but your cost of money is much higher. Now, there's a lot of complexities to that, and we won't go into that. But what I will tell you, how do U.S. banks do it? The way that U.S. banks do fixed rate loans, unlike banks around the world, is that they don't hold those mortgage loans. So when they lend money to an individual who is buying a house, and they lend it at 3%. Once the bank has lent out that money, the bank sells that loan. And it's not on the bank balance sheets anymore. Very small amount of mortgage loans are on the balance sheets of the banks. The rest of them, they've sold. Now, banks in Thailand, banks around the world, banks in the UK, they can't sell these fixed rate mortgages because there's no buyer who wants to buy a 3% fixed rate bond. Ah, but in America, there is a buyer, and that is the U.S. government. The U.S. government buys every mortgage-backed security it possibly can. It does it through the Fed, for sure, but there's an intermediary before the Fed. That intermediary is Fannie Mae, and Fannie Mae will buy, it's a quasi-government entity, it will buy all the mortgage-backed securities, or what we would call um, home loans, it would buy all of those home loans and it doesn't care that they're long-term low rate. Why? Because they're using the government's uh, power to, to borrow money long-term. And so by borrowing money long-term, what the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are able to do is to match the maturity. This is something that the U.S. government came up with many, many years ago to figure out how to do more long-term fixed rate loans so more people could buy houses. But I would argue that the government should not be in this business anymore. It should be a private entity that's doing that. And part of that is because it's a perverse incentive to give loans. The banks can give loans after loans. You remember in 2008, everybody said it was the greedy bankers that were giving out all these mortgage loans. But in fact, it was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac saying, we need these loans and the banks were selling them every loan that they made that were housing loans. So this gives you a picture of why uh, it is. So now let's look at what's happening with banks' net interest margins. Banks are not racing to raise deposit rates. So the rising rates are increasing net interest margins. Net interest margins are already very low uh, across the world. In the developed markets, they're about 1, 1.5%. They've risen a little bit, and that's because interest rates are rising, but banks are not increasing the deposit rates as fast as they're increasing the amount that they're earning on their loans. So let's go through the key points of this section. First, U.S. banks have $3 trillion in cash, which is a high 13.6% of their total assets. But that's down $1 trillion or 24 from down 24% year on year. That's a massive move. U.S. lending surged so far in 2022, and 25% of the U.S. bank balance sheets are securities, mainly government securities, lending to the U.S. Treasury as they borrow more and more money. And U.S. banks are lending again after decades of low loan growth. Ultra-low interest rates have fueled the real estate fire and it may not end nicely with real estate prices crashing. And I believe that lending to real estate is probably going to crash. And 78% of bank funding comes from low cost deposits. Banks are not racing to raise deposit rates. So rising rates are increasing 
the net interest margin, banks are seeing their profits improve. The bottom line, U.S. banks have been cranking up lending and expanding margins, but real estate could be a significant risk. So I want to talk next about looking at Chinese versus U.S. banks. I'm going to sit down while I do that. And But what you can already see is my conclusion. My conclusion is right now I prefer U.S. banks over Chinese banks. That would be my conclusion as of right now. But that could change over time. So I want to have some fun and, and understand U.S. and Chinese banks. And what I realize is that you don't need to understand every bank in China or every bank in America. You just need to understand three banks in the U.S. and three banks in China. So let's look at those three banks. In this table, I'm going to show you the top is assets and the bottom is domestic market share. So we can see that J.P. Morgan Chase is the largest bank in America with $3.7 trillion dollars. I said billion, but it doesn't, I, I made that wrong. It should say trillion, $3.7 trillion, which is 17% of the domestic market share. In China, ICBC or Industrial and Commercial Bank of China has total assets of $5.5 trillion. Also mistake, I wrote billion, but I meant trillion. That's 11% of the domestic Chinese domestic banking sector. So we can see Right there, J.P. Morgan is is very concentrated. The U.S. banking system is very concentrated with 17% of assets all at one bank. Now, let's look at the second largest bank in the U.S., and that's Bank of America, which has $3.1 trillion, or 14% of the overall domestic banking sector. And then there's China Construction Bank, which is the second largest bank in China, and they have $4.8 trillion in assets which is 9% of the domestic sector. And finally, the third bank is Wells Fargo in America, which has $1.9 trillion or in assets, or 8% of the domestic market share. And the Agricultural Bank of China has $4.7 trillion in assets, which is 9% of the bank market share. So the top three banks in America account for 39% of total assets. And the top three banks for China account for 28% of total assets. What you can see is the American banking system is more concentrated than the Chinese banking system. In other words, there's more capitalism in China than in America. No, no, just kidding. But the point is, is that um, in capitalism, we don't want a large concentration of any industry, of any company in any industry. We want competition. We think that... If something becomes a monopoly, it can be a problem. And that's the reason why we, we think that way. So in fact, uh, after 2008, the banks came up with a brilliant marketing plan. And that was called Too Big to Fail. They convinced the government and everybody that they're too big to fail. And then all of a sudden, these banks got privileged treatment. And it's a nonsense. Um, if you ever hear somebody talk about too big to fail, tell them that's bullshit. It's ridiculous. The whole purpose of capitalism is competition. If any company is ever deemed too big to fail, it is a disaster for everybody in the country. Now, I know that's not normal convention. Most people believe that there are banks that are too big to fail, but I would argue that that is a marketing scam done by the banking industry in collusion with the regulator. It is a disaster and citizens should stand up against this nonsense. But anyways, that's another point. So now let's go back and go through the Chinese and U.S. banks. First, I'm going to look at the U.S. banks. So here we can see uh, that asset growth is slowing at the U.S. banks and is driven by falling cash levels and less securities. We've seen the massive fall in track cash of almost a trillion dollars. So even though they are growing loans and other things, it's difficult to offset that. What about China? Well, Chinese banks are expanding assets mainly due to the purchase of securities. In fact, their loans are not expanding. Think about property loans and the like. Banks are not expanding in China in that area. 
but government needs money. And so obviously there's loans going out to government and all that. So here we can see that Chinese banks asset growth is in a long-term decline. The blue line in this chart shows that the Chinese bank's asset growth used to be 15 to 20%, and now it came down into 2021, all the way down to about 7%. Now, Chinese banks are seeing their assets growing substantially in the past 12 months. And basically what that's coming from is not from lending, but from securities and some other items that's happening with them. And what we can see is that U.S. banks had a surge in uh, asset growth that happened in 2020. Why did U.S. banks have a surge in asset growth? Mm -hmm. Because the Fed basically injected them with liquidity and they lent that liquidity through loans and through government and private sector bonds that they bought and put on their balance sheet. And then they unwound that and they shoved all those assets over to the Fed. And now the Fed is saying it's going to start dumping those, but it's been a very slow process. All right, let's look at net profit. Quarter on quarter, U.S. banks have seen a profit recovery, but they're still down year on year, down about 17%. So it's tough conditions right now for U.S. banks compared to a year ago, but still they're pretty strong. They're making about $20 uh, trillion dollars in, uh, or sorry, $20 billion in profit. And here we can see Chinese banks where high asset growth is driving strong profits. Quarter on quarter profits up 17%. Year on year at, uh, profits are up 17% also. So Chinese banks are doing very well at the top line right now. So let's look at the profitability of U.S. banks. The best way to look at profitability of a bank is return on assets. And anything above 1% is really good. If you're getting below or at 1%, it's not that good. So profitability of U.S. banks is low and down year on year. And what we can see is that Chinese bank profitability is also low, but it's stable thanks to the strong asset growth. So basically, it's been deteriorating slightly recently at U.S. banks profitability and in China, it's been flat. So now let's look at it longer term. This is what's fascinating. What we can see is that the peak of the return on assets for Chinese banks was at about 1.5%. And now they're down at about 0.8 or so percent. Now, this is the total banking sector. It's not just those three banks that I'm highlighting. And what we can see is that China has basically seen the return on assets fall over the long term. And U.S. return on assets have actually been recovering over time. And they lost, you know, they, it fell a lot in 2020, but that's not really a representative. But in the past 12 months, the return on assets is falling. So now let's look at the banking sector's capital. This is a simple measure, and it's equity divided by assets. Remember I told you that the banks fund their assets 10% with equity, versus a typical company that will fund its assets 40% with equity. So a bank is naturally a leveraged entity. And here we can see that bank uh, capital is stable at about, of these three banks, at about 8% of total assets. Here in China, what we can see is that the banks have a pretty similar level. We have seen uh, the bank uh, fall in their level of capital, but not by much. So I would say both are about the same and stable. But that's not the way it's been over time. Here we can look at all banks in China and all banks in the U.S. And what we can see is that Chinese banks have been recapitalizing over the past decade. When you see that blue line rising, it means that they're getting more either profit or capital. So you can recapitalize through getting more profit or you can recapitalize by injecting capital into the bank. So in that sense, the Chinese banks are doing better. Remember in 2008, the government did a lot of spending, but what we've seen is that they've been rebuilding the banking sector. So this is an interesting chart when you think about what's happening with Evergreen, Evergrande, and also the, um, the property sector in China. The banks are pretty well capitalized. Now, the most significant fall in China's banking sector is 
when we look at ROE versus ROA, so here we can see that ROE in the past in the Chinese banking sector used to be 25% ROE. That's incredible. At the time that they were earning 25% ROE, the US banks were earning 5% ROE back in 2010, 2011, 2012. And so the Chinese banks did really well, but they've been on a steady decline. Now, part of this, this is return on equity. Uh, we've seen the recapitalization. So as you put in more equity, as you retain more equity in the banks, what you're going to get is the equity section, uh, the, the denominator of the return equity uh, formula is rising faster than the numerator. And so what's happening, which is profit, and what we're seeing is that fall. So now the return equity of both banks in the US and in China is about 10%. It's been that way for the last few years. And so they're kind of equal on that footing. And how would I summarize the key points of what we just covered? First, Chinese banks are expanding assets mainly due to the purchase of securities. China bank asset growth is in a long-term decline. In 2022, U.S. bank asset growth slowed and China's rose. Quarter on quarter, U.S. bank profits were in recovery, but still down year on year. And high asset growth is driving profits at Chinese banks. The profitability of U.S. banks is low and down year on year. And Chinese bank profitability is also low, but stable, thanks to strong asset growth. Chinese bank profitability has been in a long-term decline, and U.S. banks have been recovering. U.S. bank capital has been stable over the long term. China and the U.S. now have very similar levels of capital, and but Chinese banks have been recapitalizing over the past decades, whereas the U.S. banks have not. Remember that recapitalizing a bank happens either through injecting more capital into the bank or by making lots of profits and retaining those in the bank. The more significant fall in China's banking sector's ROE versus ROA is because of the recapitalization as they're adding a lot more ROE into the banking system. What's the bottom line? The U.S. banks are strong. I don't expect a bank collapse in the U.S. The main risk, though, is the real estate loans. And there's a long-term fall from high profits at Chinese banks, which is partially driven by recapitalization. And that is the end of today's show. What did we look at? We looked at the following three topics. I'm now going to open it up for any questions before we wrap up. We've only got a couple minutes. So if you have any questions, do let me know, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that we may have. That's a lot of talk about banking sector. Uh, Nan says, Fed will not stop until something breaks. What's the weakest link? What's the crash that's coming? Debt crisis, bank crisis, property crisis. I think what you can see is that I don't think there's a bank crisis coming in the U.S. Uh, because the banks are relatively stable. I do think the banks are going to struggle with real estate loans, but it's not going to cause a crisis. So let's crush out bank crisis. That's not uh, what I think is going to happen. A property crisis, yes, definitely there's going to be a property slowdown. And you could say property prices collapsing is going to hurt a lot of consumers. But remember that the debts, the mortgage loans of the consumers in America are all at the government, at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so the banks are not really exposed that much to it. So I would say... Um, and then the debt crisis, I'd say the thing that is going to break is the bond market where bond prices for higher risk bonds, not government bonds, but higher risk bonds are going to, um, I think that there's a potential that the that those prices could fall and then the Fed would inject money into there. I think if the U.S. market were to fall, the Fed would also uh, at some point start to inject money if something breaks. All right. Any other questions? Good question, Nan. Yeah, the Fed is going to basically um, break something eventually. The rise, I have a, a great chart I just made about the rise of the interest rates, but I didn't have time to go over it since we just have a limited amount of time. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending today, and I appreciate your time, your questions, and I hope that you learned something about banks and Chinese banks versus U.S. banks, as well as the general conditions of the market. Let's have a great trading week ahead. And let's have a great month of November.